Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you guys can all hear that through the screen. Okay, good. I can't tell. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, my name's Chad Tech. I'm going to be talking about a bunch of audio theory stuff. Uh, this is a really conceptual talk. There's um, oh, okay. Uh, well, sorry about that. Let me just read this. Uh, okay, perfect. The audio tech. Oh. All right, I'm I'm Chad Tech. I'm going to be talking about a bunch of audio theory stuff. Um, this, yeah, this is a really conceptual, really theoretical talk. Uh, it just comes from my experience writing a lot of code that um, that generates audio. There's really no code in this talk at all. Um, uh, one thing I want to say real quickly, I want to totally just break the fourth wall and talk to the YouTube viewers. Um, uh, we all have the benefit of watching um, uh, Manuel's uh, Game Boy audio talk, uh, where he talked about a bunch of audio stuff too. So it's kind of like supplemental material for mine if, if for some reason I can't make things very clear. Um, but okay, anyway, back to back to the present. Um, also, before I get into my talk, uh, I work for a company called Humio. We've got a really big Elm front end, uh, and we're hiring. So if you want to work on a really big Elm front end with me, talk to me after the talk, send me a message, something like that. Uh, we are a log management platform. So if you have a big system with a lot of data, and you want to search it really flexible ways, uh, maybe ways you don't intend to until you have an emergency, uh, that's what our product's for. Okay, so now into my actual talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a few different theories of audio, so let me clarify just from the outset what do I mean by a theory of audio. I just mean like a kind of like a perspective, like a practical way of thinking about sound. Something that like if you thought about it, maybe you'd be a little bit better at whatever you're trying to do. Uh, I don't mean like uh, like a scientific theory that's like, um, you know, I think there's some kind of like bottom line accuracy that needs to be there for a scientific theory. I don't mean like music theory, which is like rules and techniques for composing uh, European music uh, with the European musical scales. I mean something a little bit more fundamental, just about the audio itself. Okay, so the first theory I'm going to be talking about is uh, called additive synthesis. Uh, this is this is a theory that all sounds are just uh, sine waves. Um, so here is a sine wave up here. Um, this one is 400 hertz. That means it happens 400 times per second. Uh, this is a time domain, so this is an extremely short period of time. Um, and I just I'm going to be showing you a lot of these um, these sound wave clips. Let me tell you about how I think about them. Um, the, we have these um, these speakers up here. You have your computer speakers at home. Um, this is like a diagram of the motion. One way of thinking about it is like the diag a diagram of the motion of the speaker over time. So sine wave is very kind of gradual, moving forward and back of the speaker. It might be happening very quickly, but gradual nonetheless. Um, then there's a lower frequency one, and then here's the two sine waves at the same time. So by combination, I mostly mean two sine waves played at the same time, but I guess I also mean sequences of sine waves and maybe sine waves just kind of popping in and out of the sound, sound domain. Uh, here's what those sound like. Yeah, so that's what that sounds like. Um, and additive synthesis is, is right off the bat, it's very good uh, at simulating uh, musical instruments that have pipes on them, like a flute, like that's just a metal pipe, or a pipe organ, which is just a bunch of metal pipes on a wall. Pipes just generally produce um, one sine wave. Uh, so here is a clip of a flute that I, that I grabbed off uh, Wikipedia. I cut out just one context. Uh, one, one little chunk of it, I kind of cherry-picked it to be honest, uh, but it looks exactly like a sine wave. Uh, and in fact, if you just play this one little clip, it sounds like this. Uh, and then here's the same frequency just generated as a sine wave from a computer. Really, really similar. Um, pipe organs, yeah, here's another, here's a clip uh, I got from just a pipe, pipe organ recording online. Uh, this looks to be about like two sine waves, uh, one lower frequency one and one higher frequency one. Uh, I keep talking about cherry picking them. Uh, this one's cherry picked as well. Here's like a non cherry picked one, right? It's a little bit more chaotic. It's got a lot of lumps in it. The point I want to make is that um, out of this theory of out of, out of synthesis isn't just that things are one sine wave. It's that whatever this chaos is, that you could describe it in terms of sine waves. So I think you could describe this in terms of sine waves. There's a lot of lumps on it. There seems to be some periodic kind of loops in there. Uh, it's, it's round. It's not noisy. Um, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of complexity in just natural sounds. Where does it come from? Well, you know, like physical reality is just kind of like a, a complicated, um, chaotic place. Um, for pipe organs as well as flutes, you, uh, there's a column of air in that metal pipe and that vibrates. That vibration has to start somewhere. In the case of a flute, um, you're blowing your breath over it. So that, that makes sound already. Just going, that kind of sound. That, that's already sound. Um, that energy has to like get converted into some kind of resonation, and that's just an in inefficient process. There's the air pressure, there's a change in air pressure. All these things matter. Oh, and the shape of the pipe matters too. Uh, if it's not uh, perfectly straight. Um, 
Moving on from there, uh, uh, horns are very similar to pipes, right? Uh, they, they're, they're also a metal tube, uh, but they have a they have a weird shape at the end, right? So here's just a, a completely boneheaded way of thinking about it. That the, it's an observation about them. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's still true. Um, if you have a cylindrical pipe, you get just one sine wave out of it, just one frequency. Um, if you have a horn, you get like kind of like a package deal of frequencies that come out. You get a bunch of sine waves, uh, and these are the, the the sine waves that you get out of a horn are called harmonics. Any uh, a whole number multiple of a frequency. So if you have uh, a base frequency of, of 100 hertz, uh, the harmonics are 200, 300, 400, base frequency 101, 202, 303. Um, so horns uh, and, and many instruments, they, they, they can be characterized as like a profile of harmonics, certain harmonics, a certain volumes, things like that. Um, by the way, uh, I could tell this exact same story regarding uh, percussion instruments. So uh, like a xylophone or a metal bar, if you hit it, you generally get one sine wave. Uh, if you have a weird shaped metal bar, like a church bell or a gong or a cymbal or something like that, you get like a, a whole package deal of, of sine waves. Um, okay, so that was my first theory. Uh, moving on to my second theory, it's called granular synthesis. So the theory of granular synthesis is that, it, it, that sounds are just sequences of short little sounds called grains. Now that sounds, that's circular right off the, off, off, off the bat, right? I just said that sounds are other sounds. Remember, I'm not, ta I'm not trying to be logical, uh, I'm trying to be practical. And this is a practical way of thinking about sounds. So I have a recording of my voice right here. This is the whole recording. Um, you can see every little wave in it. It's a very short clip. It's me saying Elm. Here's what it sounds like. So, so, so. Um, let's do some like live granular theorizing with this bit. So, um, let's try to see like what little parts are in here. Now, uh, you can kind of see uh, it has like the spike every now and then. So that seems like maybe that's the beginning of a new grain. You, this is totally an art. You can just kind of pick whatever you want. Uh, I've diagrammed out uh, this, this sound clip already. Um, so the white marks kind of just in my, in my eyes, they kind of, they, it looks like one grain every there. Uh, every point that's like a different part. Uh, I've also put like the grains that look similar in different, different boxes. So there's this blue box, this yellow box, this green box. Uh, just like coincidence, this turned out to be me going E, L, and M and L. Um, so the power of granular synthesis comes from the fact that these are, each one of these little grains is very chaotic. And it's very hard to describe in terms of um, uh, mathematical elegance. But if you know what that looks like and you just accept it for what it is, you can actually get quite far. Um, so here's, um, so I, I've used my computer to take each of these grains and then just kind of repeat them over and over again. Uh, and that's what this sounds like. Uh, uh, that's my voice. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so. Here's another one. Uh, uh, that sounds a lot like me. Just going. Uh, um, you can put them in together in random ways. Uh, uh, that might sound like broken internet voice chat. And that's not a coincidence. I think these software are built on granular principles. You know, if you're talking with someone, send a lot of little bits of your voice over the wire. Not all of them get to the recipient. Uh, it's better not to just go totally silent, but actually to just repeat the previous waves, uh, the previous grains that you received. This is why when the connection totally goes out, you get this kind of like uh, kind of sound. It's because it's just trying to simulate your entire voice with one little bit. Um, okay, so violins are a pretty good, uh, they're a pretty good candidate of a thing you can simulate with granular theory, just because however elegant they might sound, the actual waveform is not really that elegant. So these are two clips of a, a violin that they grabbed off Wikipedia. There's clearly a thing repeating over and over again, but uh, you, I don't know how to describe that in any mathematical terms. I definitely know what that lump looks like. If you can repeat that lump over and over again, you have a very good simulation of a violin. Um, but anyway, um, I keep talking about piling grains over and over again. Um, the, the real power of granular uh, synthesis comes from mutating and combining uh, grains, maybe doing like a multiplication where like two-dimensional matrix multiplication where you take one grain and kind of like flatten it on the other. Um, you can do really cool things like that. So it's a little bit more like sculpting the geometry of the waveform than it is actually knowing what frequencies are involved in that. Um, and so to, to, to demonstrate that to you a little bit, let's try to um, step by step like synthesize the snare drum sound. We're not going to be successful, but, but we're going to try. Um, well, I know because I, I know the end of the slide. But anyway, um, so an, another way of thinking about grains is um, so we, we know that sound is, is kind of something shaking in the air, right? Um, but if I, if I, it's not necessarily because if I, if I clap, if I make a clap, then that's more like an explosion of, this, of, of, of sound. So it's, it's like, it's, it's one burst of sound that comes out. Furthermore, this is the air that we're talking about. Um, sound can travel through physical materials too. So you could think of grains as a description of physical movement that happened. 
Um, so a snare drum is a, is, it's a very short thing. It's a very complicated thing. It's a bunch of physical things that just happen very quickly whenever you hit a snare drum. So I've, I've drawn, I've, I just drew this by hand. This is the grain of hitting anything with a drumstick. Like the drumstick hits something and then there's just force imparted on it. Um, I've also just drawn a grain, just, uh, just thinking about it, of uh, the, the top drum head. When, when you hit it, it kind of ripples a little bit, right? Like it's a membrane, it's, it's stretched tight. Furthermore, the sound goes from the drum head into the drum, it bounces off the walls, but it also goes straight there. So you have the same signal kind of delayed over a few different per periods of time, one directly, and then one that's just kind of a wave of the next reflections coming in. And then there's the, the bottom of the head, which also ripples. And then there's, this, there's the actual snares, which are kind of like a, a crinkle kind of crunch sound that it's just metal bouncing up against it. Um, anyway, with just taking, just thinking about how it works, drawing it out, taking these five little grains, and then just putting them in a sequence. I did, I did a bunch of mutations I can't get into, but putting them in a sequence, multiplying them by each other, uh, I came up with this sound. So I, I don't maybe it's here's here's an actual marching band snare drum that I got off the internet. I don't know, maybe maybe I'm 40 or 50 percent there, but. Um, but, but that's it. Um, so anyway, that's my talk. Uh, it, it, this is an abrupt ending. Um, what, what, I have a, yeah, this, this, uh, these slides are in Elm Project, so if you want to see some Elm code. Um, also, whenever I talk about this stuff, people want to know, well, what have you generated with this? I have some little music clips up there, too. Um, this is my Twitter handle. Again, at Humio, we're hiring. So if you're interested, just, just talk to me afterwards. Thank you.